Now, how many of you believe that instructions are necessary in life? Well, they help us out, don't they? They give us clues, guidance, give us direction. It's important to get some instruction in life, is it not? Well, how about some of those instructions that you read on products that you receive? Some of them seem a little bit too obvious, such as on the hairdryer at the hotel, it said, do not use while sleeping. Hmm. A hotel provided a shower cap and it said it fits one head. Okay, you would think that might be obvious. Try to get two heads under one shower cap at the same time might be a little bit challenging. Could be fun, who knows? Packaging on the Rowenta iron that was there in the hotel, it says, do not iron clothes on body. Hmm, okay, I know that we may find some wrinkled garments. We may want to be hasty and trying to work those all out, but I think it's obvious. Thank God for the instructions. How about Sensbury Peanuts warning? It says, contains nuts. Oh, right, I love that. I'm thrilled to know that the peanuts contain nuts. And how about the chainsaw that says, do not attempt to stop the chainsaw with your hands. Now, some of your parents may have given you some instructions. Growing up, you got insight and instructions from your mom, from your dad. Things like, you know, clean up your room, brush your teeth, share your toys, be kind to one another. Interesting thing about these instructions is that they are not given for a one-time only moment or experience. Your mom and dad didn't say, clean up your room just once in your whole lifetime. They intended you to learn by these instructions, clean up your room the rest of your life. How about your mom saying to you, share your toys? Well, that goes beyond just being a, a six-year-old. It goes beyond the rest of your life. Share that Mercedes, oh, those toys that you have. Share those things that you have, that boat, that car. You know, whatever it may be, share your toys because that was meant to be instruction for all of life. How about be kind to one another, share with others, think of others. You see, instruction is given not just for one moment. So it is true that in today's text that you read from the scripture, it's giving us instruction. Oh yes, it was Jesus giving instructions to disciples thousands of years ago, but written for us thousands of years ahead of time, later on in now, in this moment. Instructions that weren't just for one time, just for one moment, but meant for us to learn from on an ongoing experience every single day of our lives. As we read today from this text, it shares with us Jesus in his final instructions then commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem. Wait, 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 don't leave. Don't leave because I have a gift for you. Now, how many of you have been to a wedding or a special event and the host is saying, hey, don't leave, don't leave. And before we go, I've got a gift for you. Well, Sunday mornings here at City of Light, we tell every one of our visitors, please don't leave. We have a gift for you. It's our way of saying thank you for choosing to worship with us. Jesus was giving instructions to his disciples. Wait, please don't leave. I have a gift for you. And in that, this instructions were given to us. It says that this gift is something that the source, the divine source, the creator, the father, has promised all along for each and every one of us. It is that which Jesus spoke about, inviting it and imaging it in such a way that this gift, you may have heard of John baptizing in water, and they certainly were fully aware of the preaching of John the Baptist and how he was invoking a practice of immersion, dipping them into the waters of the River Jordan, washing away the old and welcoming the new. Well, Jesus says, you may have heard of that, but I want to see you immersed baptized in a Holy Spirit, a spirit of complete wholeness, a spirit that we would call holy, meaning that which is full and complete in all ways. Jesus invited them to participate in this experience with great instruction and guidance as key for their lives and key for our lives. What are we learning from this? For today is Pentecost Sunday. It was a Sunday that celebrated, uh, that we celebrate in honor the story of Acts chapter 2, of the unfolding of the Holy Spirit working within lives that gave them boldness, gave them power, a story of people coming together in unity and in strength and birthing the movement of that universal church of teaching of the way of Jesus. 
His instructions were very clear, and we might look at them and say, how are they pointing out for success in our life? Because we always want to look at this ancient instruction and how it applies for us today. So we look at this. Wait, tarry in Jerusalem. What do we know about Jerusalem? Well, Jerusalem, that word, that name, is the place of peace, an inhabitation of peace. Jerusalem was known as that center of peace and coal that named that down through the ages. Jesus is saying in his instructions, tarry in that place of peace. And I want to ask you today, have you left your Jerusalem? Have you left your place of peace? Finding that place of peace and beginning there is step number one. For in that place of abiding peace, you find a consciousness and awareness that all will work together for good, that everything is coming together on your behalf, that there's nothing to worry or fear. Yet we want to embrace a world that's full of stress, that invites us to leave our everyday location of peace, that centeredness that we may have, and wander away into worry and fear and apprehension and anxiety. And Jesus was saying, wait, tarry, in your place of peace. For us today, we understand that when we are there centered in that place, you know, it's amazing what happens to us when we breathe and relax and rest. It's amazing what happens, isn't it? You just let go of all that anxiety, you let go of all that fear, and suddenly there's clarity of mind, there's clarity of thought, there's clarity of heart. That's why so often when you gather for one of my classes, we'll begin with three deep cleansing breaths. It's very intentional because I want you to begin the class so centered, releasing all the cares and the rush and the hustle and bustle of getting to the class or coming to the class with apprehensions or fears or wondering what may unfold, but just to relax in that perfect place, to begin from that centered space of peace. Wait, don't go. Wait in that place of peace and begin from there. The instructions unfold that there in that peace, you're going to receive a wonderful gift. How great it is to know that there's such a wonderful gift to be found within that place of centeredness within the divine, centeredness in God that just says, okay, there all good is coming to me. How wonderful it is that we see this gift in such a special way. Let's talk about what kind of gift was it? Well, first of all, Jesus spoke over and over again that this Holy Spirit would come to you and it would be a great gift of comfort for you. Comfort. Well, how beautiful to rest in peace knowing that comfort unfolds there and begins there. It's there when you found that peace that you receive this gift that says, I no longer worry or stress or am I caught up in fear or loss or sense of grieving in any way. I'm not alone. I'm centered in this knowing that all the fullness of God is there. And what a gift that is to experience this great comfort in our lives. It's a gift that is there that brings strength to us in such a wonderful way. One of the most amazing things or attributes of God's wonderful presence, this beautiful comfort, is that God is all-knowing. God knows what you need before you even ask. The whole universe, all that is of God, is fully aware of your divine needs. Before you've even asked, before you even begin to think about it, before it's already two steps ahead of you, and I love that. Don't you love it when something's already out there before you and all you have to do is sort of step into it. It's already there given for you. All you have to do is receive. And that's the beauty of understanding this great gift of comfort that a peace that is there for us is found in God's wonderful grace and goodness. It's offered to us in such a wonderful way. The psalmist writes in Psalm 139 verses one through two, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I get up and you understand my thoughts, even when I'm distant from you. God knows exactly what we have need of. And in that knowing, God knows the the perfect things that are there for you. And God knows how to comfort you, how to unfold that comforting. Because it's there within you. And when we're in that centered place of peace, that's what rises up. It's the knowing of God, the understanding that comes to our hearts and our lives of the knowing that God knows what we have need of. 
There's this perfect gift for you in such a wonderful way that it's a gift of power as well. Not only a gift of comfort, but Jesus spoke of what's coming to our lives as a gift of great power that enables us to meet crisis and emergencies with courage, to do it courageously. Not to be afraid in any way, but to have this kind of power that says, I know that I know that I know what God knows. God knows my need, and I know that my need is already being met before I even ask. And so with courage, I can stand and face any kind of adverse situations. It offers us this wonderful boldness spoken of in Scripture that those who had gathered together and tarried and waited are the example of you and I when we tarry and wait in that place of peace. Something amazing happens to us. We move into a place of oneness, of centeredness in God. It's really beautiful, but when you come together, there's so much uniqueness in this room alone. You look across this room and there's no two people alike. Not a, not a one of you dressed the same today. What's going on? Everybody expressed your own individuality. Not one of you combed your hair the same way. And those who don't have hair, you didn't fix it the same way. Uh, it's just, when you look at everybody all around the room, there's just a, such uniqueness. But yet when we come together in the presence of the divine, We're brought together in a sense of unity and oneness. Those who had waited in Jerusalem, tarried to receive this wonderful gift of comfort and power, found themselves molding, meshing into the awareness of the all one. We laugh and joke about it. My age-old joke is that they were all in one accord. That is not a car, but boom. It is being one accord in complete unity. But I love what that means. As we read in the wonderful lesson from 365 devotional today, that we're all unique. And unity doesn't mean that we all just blended into homogenizing, into looking like one. We are all expressing our individuality in the wonderful way that we are all divine revelations of God, but yet we come together in one consciousness, one awareness, realizing that we truly are all united and none of us are separate not separate from God, nor separate from one another. So in that, they came together in a one accord, a united sense. I often laugh about it as I think is the story of those gathering and who gathered in that upper room. For you find there were disciples and there were family members of Jesus all coming together. And at this moment, Jesus had departed from this earth. And you can imagine as Jesus left, what his followers might have felt emotionally. Afraid, discouraged, wondering where to go next, what to do next. Our teacher is gone. The way shower, the one who laid out the pathway for us is gone. And then in that fear and despair rises up all these emotions that are so human with us and we want to blame one another. Well, it's your fault, you know. And why weren't you there when Jesus was being crucified? And you, you, did, you denied him. And you, you did all these kind of things. Why weren't you there to support him? And you can imagine the mother of Jesus and her very thoughts around all those disciples who had been so close, yet who abandoned him. Now they're together in one room. Ooh, what a mix that is. Uh Uh-huh. Can you imagine all that diversity of thought and consciousness coming together in one room? But what happens if they came to this room? It's a very special room. It's called an upper room. And why is it an upper room? Because it could have been any room, right? But it's specifically written as an upper room, signified always in Scripture. Upper meaning a higher consciousness. A place where we've raised our consciousness to a new understanding. How wonderful it is when we realize that we're each responsible for our own level of our consciousness. And it is our goal to raise that consciousness, to raise that awareness, to raise that understanding. It's not someone else's goal. It's not someone else's goal for your life. Trust me as a minister, if I would like to raise your consciousness, it was my goal, and I wanted to force you and make you do it, oh, I would love it if it was that easy. But it's your choice, it's not mine. I can't make you do things, you choose. And that's our responsibility and our choice. They gathered in this upper room with all their diversity and all their issues with a purpose of moving to a higher level of understanding, a higher consciousness. When you have that purpose and that's your goal, 
you set down a lot of issues, you know? It's like National Geographic, you have all these issues, uh huh, and you just start laying them down one by one, uh huh. It's that kind of illustration in our lives, you know? We're just laying them down, laying them down. There's great good housekeeping. There's your ladies' home journal, this issue after that, uh huh. Only it's our issues of blame, guilt, shame, uncomfortability with one another, diversity, people's difference, different perspectives, all these kind of issues. We begin to lay them down when we begin to visualize and understand that we want to move to a higher level of consciousness, a higher level of understanding of the divine love of God. When we make that as our intention, something incredible happens for us. That's right, we receive that gift of comfort, power, and boldness. It changes our life because our intention is, I want to understand. I want to know. I want to think in this way. I want to operate from this perspective. And that's what brought everyone together in unity. For the perspective, the desire of a higher consciousness was that of this divine love. We all want to experience this divine love. Wow, can you imagine if everybody proclaimed today, I want to just experience divine love. I want to exude divine love. I want to experience it back. Woo, can you imagine how electric the place could be? It can be right here and now. As we each set that as our purpose. I want to move to a higher consciousness. I want to live in the realm of the divine love. I want to see it working in me and through me and around me and for me. I want to share it with everyone else around me. And in that, I let go of everything else because nothing else matters in my mind. That's the higher purpose. That's going to an upper room. Being in that place of peace, but not just there, but to an upper room experience. Wait, wait. Wait in the place of peace. Move to that upper room because there you're going to find these great gifts that are given to you. This gift is also a gift of great wisdom that comes to us. I love the fact that when we are in tune with the very mind of God, insight, creativity, inspiration comes to us. I'm gonna tell you this, here's a great tip. Be still and know that you are God. Is to be quiet and centered in that. And being still and knowing that you're God, uh, that God is with you and around you and in you, is that infinite wisdom is there to unfold for you. That's right. You, cannot, you don't no longer have to say, I'm so stupid, I don't know this, I don't get it. But you just rest in this wonderful place of infinite wisdom unfolding for you, and you'll be amazed what insights come to you. People have had great inspirations. Sometimes they attribute them to a spicy pizza and a bad dream. But I'm going to tell you this, that when you allow the divine to unfold for you, it's not about a spicy pizza or a bad dream. It's the inspiration of the Holy Spirit at work within you, offering you this great wisdom. I have to tell you this in my personal experiences, especially when I'm preparing maybe for a talk or for a class, and I'd be writing some notes. One of the things I found is really crucial for my bedside is a pen and paper laying right there on the nightstand. Because quite often as I begin to drift off to sleep, there may be those thoughts that are centered around what I'm doing next in a class. And divine inspiration comes to me and I'm like, oh, I want to capture it right now. And what I've learned is if I don't get up and write it right then, it slips away from me. How important it is that we take these moments where the divine wisdom is unfolding for you. Insights are unfolding for you. Ideas, creativity is unfolding for you. Great things are there, so write them down, jot them down. Have a notepad in your purse or your hand, handbag or in your backpack or wherever it may be. Have it handy so that you capture these things for the inspiration of the Spirit is always at work within our lives. It's a gift of wisdom that's there for us at all times. How important it is that we understand this as it's working for us for this gift then will transform us in a powerful way. This gift Jesus spoke about to the disciples will baptize them, immerse them. Wow. You know what it's like to be immersed? You know? It's like you're way under the water. You know, I'm a pastor. I come from the Baptist background, the the baptism background, you know? You kind of hold people under until they promise to tithe. And then you bring them back up. You know, it's one of those, you immerse them completely. Yeah, exactly. You know, that was my childhood upbringing when it came to baptism. You know, it's one of those kind of things where you're like, they've got to be totally immersed. You can't just, they can't have their head out. And there are people who would say, Pastor, I'm a little afraid of water. 
I'm not so good with this. I'm not sure I can really do, is it okay if I just go down this far? Is it okay if I just go a little bit? Can I just dip, dip, dip a little bit? Can I just, can I sprinkle a little bit? Can I splash? Can I just do this? The whole idea was to be immersed, symbolizing that all of the old is buried and the new is risen. That baptism that we speak about in our day-to-day life of every day releasing the old and being transformed by the renewing of our mind. Renewing, refreshing, letting go of the old and welcoming the new is a whole baptism experience. How powerful it is in our life. But we must immerse, not dip, not splatter, not sprinkle, not splash, but to be immersed in this spirit, to be immersed in all that is divine and how important it is, that you are drenched, not just a dab, but that you are all in that way immersed in it. And this is the wonderful gift that's coming to you, that you're going to be so immersed in the spirit of God. It's going to be there for you, that you will be in this place of such great spiritual illumination that you'll actually forget some of our practical life. That's right. Wouldn't that be wonderful to be so heavenly minded that we let go of some of the earthly concerns? To be so spiritually minded that we no longer are worried or concerned about the physical that we're day-to-day journey of our lives? That we're so heavenly minded that we move to a consciousness of, of an upper level of understanding of the divine love of God that we're not even worried, concerned. But we move and breathe and have our being in all of God. That's the beauty of this immersed experience this gift that's there for us. Now, what happened to these disciples that we could learn from as we see these instructions followed through? Well, it says on the day of Pentecost, they moved out of that upper room in a spirit of one accord and of unity, of love, and they began to move out into this wonderful harvest celebration that was happening in the city. And as they moved out, each and every one of them spoke in other tongues. Now, what is that other tongues? but spoke in languages that others heard and understood. You know, it's beautiful to have the gift of love, and it's a language that everyone understands. When you speak in love, everyone comprehends that. When we speak in other languages that are not love languages, languages of fear, language of anger, language of frustration, stress voices, not everybody comprehends what you're trying to say or what's going on in your life because those voices speak something different that not everybody hears. But interestingly enough, everybody hears love and understands love. What happened in this group? They received this wonderful, holy, complete spirit. That spirit is divine and it's full of all the goodness of God. It is love. And they began to speak forth to one another in ways that people of other cultures and communities began to understand. Wow, what a world it would be if we embraced these instructions and we too were so immersed that we spoke in other tongues other than anger, separation, fear, judgment. And we spoke the language of love to one another. When we speak that language, how it unites us. Now, how many of you watched the royal wedding? How many of you watched? There was a royal wedding, yes. You, uh-huh. Okay, for some of you who may not have been following, there was a royal wedding yesterday. I know they were struggling as to who was going to take Meghan Markle down the aisle, and I had offered, and I realized that coming to City of Light was far more important, and I couldn't be gone from you all. And I read that was priority one. So we let Prince Charles take Meghan Markle down the aisle. If you were watching, you heard the pastor preach and he spoke such a fiery sermon about the message of love and how when we speak that language of love, it's transformational. If you listened to his message, he spoke that love is like a fire. And what did we find? That those who were filled with the Spirit, as they moved out, we find it reading in Acts chapter 2, they spoke with tongues of fire. Fire that consumed. And in Scripture, we find the symbolism of fire, that which consumes all that is evil or all that is seen to be or appears in the world of being negative or of error, we might look at. So fire is consuming and it's burning away. They spoke in ways that consumed error, that consumed and burned up, that burned up and let go and released in all this diversity. They spoke in a way that everybody began to release, shall we say, in the flames of the fire of their tongues. 
and release to say, wow, what a wonderful world we live in. What a wonderful place where we're all experiencing divine love. That's the birth of the early church. The early church was built on a message of fiery tongues that burned up error and loss and fear and negativity that set fire to people's lives of a passion of love for one another that built and thousands came, as scripture says as an example. So we too might learn from these instructions. What if we waited in our Jerusalem in our peace place? What if we waited in such a place where we were at such peace that the gift that is promised to each and every one of us unfolded for us. A gift of wisdom and comfort and a power and of holy boldness. A wisdom that comes to us that gives us a transformational experience that we're so immersed in that suddenly we are different. We are changed. We are transformed. How is it then that we receive this wonderful gift? Well, it comes to us of understanding that we are then all one and there is no separation. We understand that we are like fish in water who are sometimes unable to comprehend the water around us. You know, see, this is where we live sometimes because we forget. We're unable to comprehend that the divine is always around us. God's love is already in us, through us, around us, and for us. We're like fish, and we're swimming in it, and sometimes we can't even see it. We have to recognize it. So today, we're calling you to recognize by these instructions to somehow get so caught up uh, that we sometimes get caught up in our human conditions. We forget about who we are as divine children of God, created in the likeness and image of God and all that goodness that's around us. And so I'm created in that. So are you created in that. So is everyone created in that. And when we get this, we begin to speak with tongues of fire. Tongues of a language of love that consumes all error, that consumes all negativity, consumes all stress and fear, and people are united and come together. I want you to understand that this instructions is there for us today, not just once. Your mom says clean up your room, not just once. Your mom says share your toys, not just once. Your mom or dad said we invite you to think of others, not just once. And the instructions on the hairdryer, don't use it when you're sleeping, not just once. All these things are there for us to remember. The beautiful instructions from this passage of Scripture are there for us today, inviting us to remember this. Find your place of peace and don't leave until you've received a promised gift, that gift of comfort, strength, boldness, wisdom. And in that, be so immersed in it that you become a transformational presence in your world, in your family, in your workplace. You become that which begins to set fire to all error and all confusion and burn it away. That what happens is we create a world where we're all in one accord. Amen.